Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for August 1st, 2021. The first reading, the thematic Old Testament reading is Exodus 16, two through four and nine through 15, a favorite text of mine. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is 2 Samuel uh, eleven twenty six through 12, 13. The Psalm is Psalm 78, 23 through 19. The epistle is Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And here we are, the second week in John chapter 6, verses 24 through 35. The bread of life uh, discourse. Yes. And uh, so as I mentioned last week, I'm just going to jump right in, uh, which I knew you both were hoping I would. Uh, this, as I mentioned last week, what we've moved into now in this section of the of chapter six is one of the dialogues. And so you've got the you've got a dialogue here. Then Jesus will move into his primary discourse, verses thirty five through fifty nine, and then we'll finish out with a dialogue where some of the disciples uh, are will stay with him, and as a result of this, some of the disciples will go away, and we have the first mention of Judas uh, Judas betrayal. Uh, so this so one of the themes of this dialogue then. Is, uh, is something that I didn't mention last week, but it's this theme in the Gospel of John of misunderstanding. And so like in verse seven, in verse, if you go back to verses six and seven uh, or, or five, where Jesus says, where, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? And Philip answers with misunderstanding in that, uh, that it, which is like Nicodemus, which is like the woman at the well, where he, doesn't you know know of course what Jesus is trying to get him to see and Philip says well six months wages was not by enough bread for him um, uh, bread for each of them to get a little there's a boy who has five barley loaves so there uh, but what there's so I mean what is this among so many people and that's really what we're getting in this section is that 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 the crowd uh, the can or and his disciples, they cannot see beyond the miracle at this point. What is this miracle? Um, what is this miracle going to mean? Uh, what is it, or in the case of John, what does this sign point to? And that this is that this the sign is pointing to fundamentally that this is the presence of God. Uh, it, it, and particularly verse. 29 Jesus answered this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent that's really like the hinge verse here and then but then what does it mean to believe that this this is Jesus this is God in your presence uh, is what then the rest of the discourse is going to uh, uh, going to unpack and Jesus starts you know talking a little bit about that. Uh, toward the end of this lecture, where Jesus is interpreting the manna story, uh, and uh, and that is, I think, that's a critical piece to this section. Is uh, and preaching this section is, are you are the recognition of the pointing to uh, uh, God's presence in Jesus, and um, but yet this is at first going to be misunderstood. And, and what does that, what does it actually really mean? Yeah. Uh, so then I guess my question is, what difference does that make then? Um, as I think about people who like stories about Jesus healing people, they like stories about Jesus feeding people, they like stories about Jesus confounding the leaders. They won't give up on any of those deep convictions about what makes Jesus important or life-changing for them. But the idea of Jesus being God is still a stumbling block for many within the church. I think if you've got people mm -hmm. to be really honest, to think about that, what difference does that make for John then that this is, I mean, to go back to that line in verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Obviously, we know believing is more than just saying the creed without crossing your fingers behind your back when no one's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not so much will yourself to believe harder. 
but there's something about recognizing Jesus as more than just one more prophet or one, more than one more helper right. for John. And so I think the answer to my question probably has something to do with eternal life, but I'm not certain. So I'm wondering what you both think about that. This is the difference it makes, right? To believe that Jesus is God mm -hmm. and that Jesus reveals the God he calls father. That what, What's the payoff of that for not for John's ancient audiences, but for our audiences today? Well, I, I think it's like, I, I think in some ways, like what is it that, uh, you, well, I'll, I'll say it this way. When you, when you look at verse 30, so they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness as it is written, they gave them for, um, bread from heaven to eat. And, it, and you know, the sign that they're pointing to there or what they want, what, what, are, what connection are they making there that our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness? What did that mean? What did that point to? Not that they were fed, not just that they were fed, they were hungry. And so they got fed, but what did it point to at the end of the day? God was with them. Uh, God's presence was with them in the wilderness. And so in, in a sense, what Jesus is trying to, I think, do here, what God, the gospel of John is doing here is that God is once again present uh, and, and, and particularly if you look at this, you know, post 70 and the Johannine community as being, you know, a sectarian thrown out of its uh, a community community uh, that, that they are, what they're asking for is, is, or making the connection, this is God's presence. And that's exactly what John is trying to, is trying to make. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? I mean, I think that, um, I, at, the I end still, of the, at, at the end of the day, they're requ they, they are requesting what Jesus is asking, but they yeah. just maybe don't know it. <laughs> I, um, I think that the answer to that, the, the fact that maybe a lot of the graduates of our school, and we hear from a lot of pastors in our tradition, um, that they, they have a hard time articulating uh, the, uh, the uniqueness of Jesus and why Jesus matters. And um, so what's at stake is whether or not Jesus is the answer for the spiritual problem within you and outside of you, which drives, which drives me back to the law part of long gospel, uh, which is what is wrong with the world? How do we as Christians reflect on what's wrong with the world. And it's, it's not just an issue of power. Uh, it's not just an issue of power differentials. What's, what's wrong with the world is our word is sin. Now there's, there's problems with the term original sin, especially as it goes wrong in Augustine and since then, but that we are born into a creation that's broken and we ourselves are broken. And that Jesus, because he is God in our flesh, offers a multitude of responses and answers to the brokenness within us and around us. And you can see, it, you can see that in the way that uh, the Exodus story is a story of liberation. It's a story of provision. So we're getting that story of provision here with the manna and then later with the quails, but it's a story of relationship. You will be my people, I will be your God. It's a story of, of law, you know, it's the giving of the land. It's a story of not trusting and learning to follow God and having short memories about the good things God has done with us. I mean, it's so many things. Uh, and that multidimensional sense even gets greater uh, in Jesus. Yeah, I think, I think that th that's helpful too, because it makes me think in another way to answer, and you mentioned this, Matt, another way to answer your question, what difference does this make? Um, I think another key verse here is verse 33. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
and so and so part of what you're saying there, Rolf, is what does life mean when you think about um, when you think about what God does? And for John, this this life that's offered uh, and and uh, verse 27, eternal life. We've talked about this before, but it's not, it's not, it's not only a promise of life to come, but it's the it's the sharing in the entirety of Jesus' life, uh, which means fundamentally this relationship with God. Life is relationship, and then it's from that relationship is provision and protection and presence and all of that. But it's it's. Um, and and really like the other sort of uh, clue to that or justification for that reading as well is that they say in verse 34, sir, give us its bread always. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So first of all, he just says, you know, I am the bread from heaven. And now he's made that connection between bread and life. And that then he'll build on that um, going forward. So um, that was helpful. Thank you, both of you. Yeah. I'm going to add, just because it's important, the Exodus story is also a story of forgiveness as the people sin, and it's a story of mission, uh, that God redeems the people and then gives them a mission to be a priestly kingdom. Mm -hmm. I just had to add those extra dimensions, sorry. Yes, and I have one more dimension to add, and then, we can, um, <laughs> then we can move on. But I, because I promised I would I'd say more about this this week, uh, I think that uh, it's very important for the preacher to think about uh, the fact that, again, there is no sacrament of the Eucharist or the last, the Lord's Supper in John. If you locate that on that last night that Jesus shares with his disciples, it, Jesus, all of Jesus' life, not his impending death, but all of Jesus' life institutes the sacrament in John. And so that sharing the sac, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's worth thinking on your part, if you can imagine the sacrament, Johan, uh, a Johannine sacrament, if you can think about uh, the way in which we talk about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in any kind of Johannine way, um, particularly since our fundamental imagination for that is the synoptics and Paul. And so that to share the Eucharist for John uh, is not, as I said last week, is not a remembrance, is not a commemoration, but it's to share in all of Jesus' life, which is why this is located in the middle of Jesus' ministry and not at the end. And then there's so many then connections to back to chapter four, which the commentary brings out. And then of course, to John 21, where you have, a, you have another Eucharist, if you will, in John 21, come and eat and there's bread and fish. And so um, that the fact that these Jesus as host of the table are, the fact that that's located in the middle of his ministry and as his in his resurrected presence, I think makes a huge should be a cause for some sacramental reflection on the part of the preacher. Anyway, that's it. All I got for this week. So I love Exodus 16 uh, so much. I love this story. Um, in the narrative of Exodus, we've just had the Exodus itself, and then Moses and Miriam sing for a while. That's fun. And then the first thing that happens is the people forget what God has done with them. If they forget all of the, uh, the miracles in Egypt, they get out and they complain. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill. I like flesh it. Flesh pots. I know. That's where I, my band, the flesh pots of Egypt, get our name. We've also, we were also once, somebody said, hey, can your band, the uh, the Egyptian meatheads, uh, could they play for, for this event? <laughs> I said, you mean the flesh pots of Egypt? So we were, <laughs> been, we've also been called other things, but the, uh, the flesh pots, it's a great story, is 
I mean, it's, in some ways, it's a story about just the hierarchy of needs. The, you know, the first two things you need are security and food. Uh, and of course, they, so they don't have those. But it's a story of unfaith. And so Israel is narrating here a story about the human condition. It, our human condition is to have short memories and uh, to be afraid. And therefore, it's a story of immediate infidelity to God. They're narrating about themselves. And nobody in antiquity told this kind of story about themselves. Peoples tend to tell self-glorifying stories. Um, you know, uh, we make up glorifying stories about our ancestors. Uh, you know, uh, so the story of, the, uh, you know, um, Washington and the cherry tree never happened, but you know, it, this is a great story. This is how great our nation is. You know, our first president could not tell a lie. And um, Israel goes the opposite way. The first story you hear is immediately after being uh, elected, Abraham and Sarah lose their faith and Abraham throws Sarah under the bus, you know? Uh, and here immediately after having been reelected and saved, Israel forgets God. And so, I mean, I, it's, it's an amazing thing about the Bible uh, teaching us. It's a story of theological anthropology and then God's miraculous provision and response. And of course, the great detail, Manna is, in verse 15, mana. What is it? That's what uh, mana is Hebrew for. What is it? Have you ever eaten quail? Either one of you? Have you ever had a quail? Just eggs. Mm. Just curious. I've had, I've had the little baby chickens. The, the Cornish hens? Cornish game hens. Cornish game hens. Is that close I, enough? I don't... That's pretty... I, you know... Yeah, maybe. Anyway, I don't think I've had quail. I'm not a big. Uh, I'm not a big uh, poultry game. Guy? No, I'm. A, oh. I'm not a big. Anyway, I don't eat uh, hunted uh, animals very much, and that's of course quail is where I where I would probably have to get it around here. <laughs> and I'm not a very good shot. I'm. I, I, if I had to hunt for a living, I would probably only eat fish anyway it's a great story do you want to bring should we bring in psalm 78 here um i mean it's clearly uh, yes. here's my connection manna <laughs> well, you know, that's that's the connection yeah yeah um it's yeah so I well it's we'll a, it, it allows us to talk about retelling that here's a story that wasn't just narrated once in Exodus, but is then retold mm -hmm. in the Psalter. Uh, Jerome mm -hmm. Creech does a nice job bringing that, that point forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also he talks about that it's commentary on the Exodus story, that it's the provision of manna wasn't just, I'm gonna help you survive, but I'm gonna teach you to be, he calls them an obedient people, uh, which is, which is, Partly true, I would say also maybe a, a, um, a reliant people. It's, it was, it's part of the way in which the wilderness was not just a very long trip without a map, but was also a formative time for the nation as God was trying to um, reveal who God was to them. And so just to kind of you know, talk about how storytelling is so important in that regard, like what do we learn from the past um, and how does that shape character or faith or virtue for the future? Well, and I think I think not only that, but also how how we even see in scripture the way in which these stories get reinterpreted. Uh, and so we're so our act of 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 interpreting, reinterpreting for preaching, but as we do that collectively and communally uh, together as as believers is, uh, is what we do. Uh, this, this is part of what it means to be people of faith is to reimagine these stories here and now, to reinterpret these stories here and now. How are we hearing this story? Which I think, not that you want to do a whole sermon on, you know, context of biblical interpretation, <laughs> but but it's it's a way in which we can be demonstrative and and think about uh, that. That's what these. That's part of what these stories do and part of what we do each and every day, each and every week 
uh, is is reimagining these stories in, in our time and place. And so the psalmist uh, helps us with that. And then Jesus in, in the Gospel of John. Second Samuel 11. Yeah, this is the part, I mean, this, uh, this is the part of the story that people like. It, I don't uh, like this part of the story. I didn't say, I didn't mean everybody, but, you know, in general. So talk about why you don't like this part of the story. I'd love to hear about that. I, I, well, the, the, the parable is, is, is nice. And the, the, the sting operation is nice where Nathan, you know, sets up you know, sets the trap and David walks right into it. Of course, that's always fun to watch other people fall. Uh, but the, the, the punishment, how it's narrated. I, yeah. God seems more upset about the murder than about Bathsheba um, in confronting David. And then just some of the language of like payback, like I'll raise up trouble from within your own house. I'll take your wives uh, and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son it's like you know the judgment just compounds violence against women it's it's not it, it's uh yeah it's it's the same i i see i see nathan or by extension god getting into some of the same trouble that we saw with the mm -hmm. original narrative with bathsheba and that's you know that's a function of I get it, the patriarchy of the text, but I think it sounds just awful, right? To punish you, I'm going to humiliate you by um, taking your wives from you and then giving them to other men. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, that's why, yeah. Let's just read, let's cut some verses here and just read the parable and then <laughs> hide the rest. No, I'm kidding about that. But it's, I think it just needs to be named that there's uh, the, the sense of recompense here is, is, um, not justice for everybody involved, as far as I can tell. Other than that. I agree. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's paired uh, for those uh, for those traditions or congregations that use the semi-continuous. It is, of course, paired, you can predict, with Psalm 51, 51. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is, I mean, that's the right pairing to go with it. Um, I do think that in a culture which has essentially dis, uh, discarded God's law and, and, and the concept of sin, uh, and not surprisingly, there's very little forgiveness in our public life. I do think that uh, the essential notion of the of sin and the forgiveness of sins, though, is critical to Christianity, and it's critical to how to reconciliation. The idea that God is willing to forgive uh, sins, and that the purpose of forgiveness is to create a different future, so that our past sins are not the only thing that will define either our future or the world's future, is Absolutely. It, I think at times the Lutheran tradition has, has overemphasized that and reduced the good news to, for, to the forgiveness of sins. But the opposite, uh, to swing to the opposite extreme and forget about the good news of, of the forgiveness of each of our sins uh, is also uh, a mistake. Um, David's key, the key moment here is David's recognition that his ju the just sentence, this man deserves to die. Nathan, you are the man. And then David recognizing the reality of that um, is obviously um, there's something critical to our own spiritual life to be able to recognize our own sins. Most of the people that I hear confessing sins are confessing someone else's sins, not their own. The, okay. Yeah, the story, the story gets, um, yeah. Anyway. Well, I think there is something to be said for that. I, you know, that uh, I have sinned against the Lord and uh, 
uh, and what you said, Rolf, like when, when is it that, when is it that we actually say that um, and admit that? And yeah, I mean, the, one of the things I have loved about being Lutheran as, uh, is that we used to uh, start off every worship service with uh, the confession and forgiveness of sins. Now, a lot of places have quit doing that because uh, they think it's, you know, like a downer. But I actually think it's the best news that there is, is that my sins are forgiven. That uh, as one of my uh, as one of my African American friends says, every morning, God washes away our sins in an ocean of forgiveness. And I just think that's really thumbs up. You should come to my Presbyterian church every single Sunday. We do confession, insurance, pardon, like clockwork. So we're always, uh, we always take in wayward Lutherans. Come on well, We have a lot of them, in fact. <laughs> well, my church, my congregation, we're still good too, but yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah. So anyway, right. go to Ephesians. Ephesians. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. This is such a dense letter. There's just so much. This is this is the ordination text, isn't it? It Not is my ordination. Oh, yeah, you, you hear this a lot at where, uh, where? What part of it? I've never. I don't know. If I, I ever... beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Oh, humility and gentleness, yeah. patience, bearing with yeah. one another in love, making yeah. every effort. See, you know that I've heard this at ordinations. I have, but it's not just for preachers. <laughs> no, of course not. Pastors. <laughs> That's, well, that's, you know, that's a good point, right? Is we yeah. tend to do this individualistically, of course. Well, it's, it's plural, of course. Each individual's job and and even like an ordination service, right? What does it mean for the whole community to hold this? I, I was thinking about that in particular when it talked about uh, maturity in verse 13 and, and growing to the full stature of Christ, that that's often taken again, to talk about spiritual, <clears throat> excuse me, spiritual growth, the spiritual formation of individuals. What does it mean to think about a whole church growing into maturity? Congregation or even the church at, as a whole. Um, and the problem with maturity is that we tend to have this sense of it being developmental, that it's, you know, it, it goes in a straight line, that once you're there, you realize that you're there. But the church is always a maturing church. I think at least in my view, now we'll go back to my Presbyterianism, right? This idea of a church that's always reforming and always in need of being reformed, that the church collectively is always on this path. And so to think about this in terms of, you know, what is a, what is a, what does witness look like? What does public witness look like? What does a credible witness look like? And how are we doing this together? As opposed to just saying, you know, the pastor knows some of you are less mature than others, and we're expecting a lot more of each of you. <laughs>